wonderful panel on the future of food. Thank you so much to the Future Party for hosting this great day of events and conversations. I think that at a time when our world is chaotic and it's so stressful, it's so great to come together and talk to smart people about big ideas and how we can transform our planet for the better. And I think that this topic is so much fun because we all have to eat. So, you know, thinking about how we can make our system better, you know, through something that we all have to have to eat <laughs> food. Um, I think it's a really powerful way to change our planet. And we have four amazing panelists today who are all leaders in the industry and come from different technological backgrounds and experience. So I think the conversation is going to be fabulous. So I'm going to welcome on our panelists now. And the first up is Michael Selden, who is the CEO and co-founder of Finless Foods. Hi, Michael. Hi, Lucy. So excited for this conversation. I'm gonna bring in the next panelist, Matthias Riel, who is the founder and CEO of Beef. Hey Lucy, thanks Hi. for having me. Yeah, thank you. And we've got Kawa Saplissi, the founder and executive chairman of Barnana. Hi Lucy, thanks for having Hi. me. And we've got Tina Owens, she's the senior director of food and agriculture impact at Danone, North America. So thank you, Tina. Hi. Hi Lucy, good to see you. Uh, this is going to be a fun panel. Uh, you know, we we've all gotten to chat backstage, and we, we we talked a little bit yesterday. So I think we're going to have a lot of fun. I think that you know what's so great about talking about food, like I said a second ago, is that we all have to eat. And right now, with our conventional agricultural system, we're looking at something that's hurting our planet. And I think what all of you all are doing in in your work is showing that food doesn't have to be you know, degenerative on our planet. It can actually make it better and we can also eat better and have healthier foods. So I think it's such a fun and inspiring conversation that we're about to have. So let's start off uh, and we're gonna go around and I'll start with who did I bring in first? I brought in Michael first. So let's ask you first and we can each go around and answer this. What's your favorite way to eat sustainably and reduce your carbon footprint, Michael? Okay, I'm the worst person to ask first, but I'll do it anyways. I will answer the question. I have a personal vendetta against the term carbon footprint because it was coined okay. by British Petroleum in order to take bonus for climate change off of living corporations and put it on to individual people to make sure no change happens and it worked really well. We're talking about it. That said, so answering the question, I do some of that stuff anyway. Um, this uh, sweater I got from a fantastic fair trade company called Nadam. I drive a, an all-electric 2012 Mitsubishi Aimev, which looks like a weird golf cart, but it's great not having to pay for gas. Um, and like I, I try and eat as plant-based as possible. I'm addicted to Miyoko's um, cheese. Uh, that stuff's just. But I would say the most impactful thing I'm doing for carbon footprint is um, organizing politically. I've been phone making for Jackie Fielder. She's an indigenous activist running for California State Senate and the environment's a huge part of her platform. So it's all sorts of stuff. You're doing a lot. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. All right, that's that's a tough act to follow. Is everyone doing as much as Michael to reduce their car or with the way that they're eating and how they're reducing their carbon footprint? Matthias, what about you? Sure, so we are doing Giflo. Uh, we have a beautiful office, which is a house um, in an alpaca ranch um, where they're growing alpacas in Ventura County. And this this house has a big garden where we're growing uh, wildflowers uh, because we believe that's one of the most impactful ways to, uh, to remove a uh, carbon uh, footprint in the world, especially also promoting uh, pollinators uh, health and biodiversity, giving them lots of sources of food uh, to thrive, uh, which are, they're, they're very needed as we will discuss today. Nice, thank you, Matias. And uh, Kawe, how about you? Uh, unfortunately, I do not have alpacas at my house, but that <laughs> sounds uh, pretty cool. Um, I, I try to support all the companies that uh, are doing their part, uh, sustainable companies, companies like ours, they're like reducing food waste, uh, companies that are giving back to small communities, companies that uh, promote uh, regenerative agriculture, and uh, cooking at home, trying to reduce our own waste at home. And I think that this is one of the silver linings from uh, COVID. Uh, most people uh, got back to the kitchen and are learning how to cook, uh, utilizing everything that's in their fridge. I think uh, uh, food waste is a big part of uh, the contribution to methane gas and global warming. So if we all reduce food waste a little bit, I think we can do our part, but there's a lot of different ways that, that we can help. 
Nice. Thank you. And Tina, what, what, how do you eat more sustainably for the planet? Um, well, in addition to eating more sustainably, I actually uh, purchase a lot of these things because I think that uh, using things that other people are done using is uh, a great way to eat. But I also don't have a hot dog farm, uh, but we do uh, raise chickens and pigs here. So uh, we're running 20 acres of permaculture here, like Nick said, uh, in order to eat food that is as close to the land as possible and where we can bring our neighbors and family and friends along uh, for the journey with us. Thank you, Tina. And I think your your audio your your audio is a little low, so we're gonna get it to be a little bit higher. But I know you were saying in your answer that you are a part, on a permaculture farm and you're raising your food and you're you're really um, uh, you know able to do that farm to table experience. Which I I live in New York City, so I am very very jealous. The most I can do is maybe grow some you know leafy greens on my roof. So that's so awesome that you're able to do that. So we're gonna go now, I have, I have questions for all of you because I think the organizations that you're part of are just so cutting edge and what you do every day is just fascinating to me and I think to all of our audience. So Michael, let's go to you and you know, you Finless Foods, you're essentially uh, growing uh, bluefin tuna in a lab and I, I wanna know how this works. How are you making lab grown fish and uh, am I gonna be able to try some soon? That's the idea. <laughs> yeah, so what are we doing? What we do is we take a small sample from one real fish once, pull that sample out, and can grow that into effectively an unlimited amount of sashimi. And so this is sashimi that is on a cellular level, the same thing that people are eating today. We're just growing it outside of a fish instead of inside of a fish. Um, so it's not made of plants. It's like a, it's a, it's a real thing. And um, right now we're in a lab, but when we get to production, we'll be out of the lab because labs for R&D. Um, not for production. So why bluefin tuna? Um, bluefin's an awesome entry to market for us because it shows that you can have food that is sustainable and not compromise. We want to create something that is like this incredibly flavorful and beautiful like dining experience. And so we want to start with the highest end stuff that we can possibly make. For a really long time, people have seen ethical eating as a compromise where it's like, yeah, I can eat something sustainable, but it doesn't taste as good. We wanna flip that narrative completely. We wanna make food that is at its core ethical and sustainable, but that competes on market metrics. We want what we make to be the best tasting, the most affordable, the most nutritious, and the most convenient. And we think starting off with bluefin tuna with you know, uh, its conservation message because it's on and off the endangered species list, as well as the high levels of mercury and plastic found in wild caught tuna, um, as opposed to what we make, which has none, we can create something that beats the uh, conventional version, not just mm -hmm. on morals and ethics, but on all the other metrics that people buy food on. And that's how we think change will really be made. That's so cool. And what's the base? Can I ask you just as a follow up, because I'm fascinated about this. What are the base materials that you're using to then grow that, you know, sashimi? Uh, with I'm not in a lab because you said it's going to be out of a lab, but for now in a lab, what's the base material you're using? Yeah, I appreciate you making the distinction. Um, the base <laughs> material, so other than like that one initial sample, that's from a real tuna, but we don't need to do that anymore. We've already gotten tuna cells. We have them working in our facility here in, uh, well, I'm in Oakland, but our facility is in Emeryville, California. Um, we're feeding it plants. I mean, we're feeding it salts and sugars, the same stuff that you would find in like Gatorade, basically. Um, we're feeding them long chain fatty acids. So these are from algal sources. These are like omega-3s, omega-6s, the things that you would find that people really care about is nutrition and fish. And then we're feeding them proteins produced via fermentation. So we have like a feed for it in the same way that you'd have to feed animals on a farm. Our feed is completely um, plant and fungal based. This is so cool. I think the lab grown meat thing is so fascinating. And I am, I can I come out there and, and try it for a story, you think? Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, so we're gonna keep going on to uh, Kawe who runs Barnana and he's the founder of that company. They're focused on food waste. And so can you explain to our audience how you make your Barnana snacks and how your process helps to tackle this big issue, which is uh, food waste? Yeah, of course. And, and for those of you out there that don't know about Barnana, we make uh, several lines of banana and plantain-based products. So we have chewy banana bites. They're sweet and delicious. We have plantain chips. Uh, we have banana brittle, uh, tortilla chips made out of plantains. Um, the idea is started uh, based on a product that I grew up eating in Brazil. So uh, I wanted to bring that product to the US. 
I, I went to visit Banana Farms and, and learn about a big issue that we have today, which is food waste. So uh, bananas are the number one selling item in grocery stores. That's what we buy the most. And because of that, there is a big waste that comes with that production. If the bananas are not perfectly green and in the, per the right size or shape, they cannot be exported because they will go bad before arriving uh, to the stores. So about 20% of all these bananas that we grow end up uh, going back to the land landfills. So what we realize is we could uh, buy those bananas, uh, reduce food waste, and create a second source of income to the farmers. We still need to wait for the bananas to get to the right uh, ripeness level, but we realize that uh, doing that, we could reduce a lot of the methane gases that go back um, to the atmosphere if those bananas go to, uh, to waste. Uh, getting involved in this, we started learning a, a lot about the food industry and realized that there was a lot of things that we could do to help the environment. So to date, we already upcycled over 100 million bananas. We are now working with close to 200, uh, sorry, 2,000 um, indigenous farmers in the Amazon region. That, that promote agroforestry. So supporting these indigenous communities, we are helping protect uh, the planet, protect the Amazon region. Um, and we most recently started working with regenerative, regenerative agriculture. So we realized that um, we could help farmers that have been farming conventionally for a long time to start changing the way uh, they farm. So uh, we launched the first product is not organic, but is re regenerative. Those are our tortilla chips. And eventually the goal is to become organic, but we're giving these farmers a path to become right. more sustainable in that time. That's so cool. I think you, what, what's cool about Barnana is it's a simple problem or a complex problem, but you're finding a very elegant and simple solution. And I love that you all are working with indigenous farmers because we understand that they have this wisdom of how the earth works and, and working with the earth that I think a lot of Western farmers uh, historically have been less sensitive to. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so first of all, they use that food for their own consumption. They are incentivized to protect the forest. And uh, when you work with agroforestry, you, you have symbiosis with the, the forest and they are incentivized to protect the whole environment. Plus they grow all these different things in uh, near our, our, our uh, plantains and our bananas. So it makes for a more uh, sustainable uh, way of farming and environment. Plus, uh, this is really interesting because when I started the company, I didn't realize that uh, we could, could work with small producers. In my mm. mind, to have a successful company, you had to produce a lot of food in one place only and have a monoculture. And I was proven wrong. So, uh, and, and I'm glad I was because it's really cool that we get to work with thousands of people that uh, don't have uh, the desire uh, to expand that way they don't need to cut, cut down trees to like produce more food. Uh, that is, I'm, I'm glad you discovered that too because I think when you have these farmers on these smaller holdings, they, they have more of a responsibility to care for the land. That's where they live. And I think that regenerative agriculture is gonna be a through line through this conversation because everybody is connected to it in some regards. So I'm gonna move now to Tina. And you uh, are the Senior Director for Food and Agriculture Impact at Danone, which is a huge company that all of us know. So can you tell me about your role there and what, you, how you've brought regenerative agriculture farming to the forefront of that large company? Yeah, well, first, let's try my sound. You can hear me better? I think I can hear you better, yeah. All right, great. So Danone America. Oh, it's a little, it's coming in and out a little bit. I heard you at first. Tech, you know, we're all working in this Zoom world with the audio. I right, think, um, gonna, uh, let's go back and um, we'll try that back. So, uh, actually, I'm getting a note that I just need to speak really, really loudly. So yeah. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I live in rural Michigan. Um, this is a very good way of making the same stuff. We actually much better internet uh, available widely everywhere uh, in this virtual world. So the known North America is the world's largest C Corp, which means we have a triple bottom line of people, planet, and profit. We also own the largest USDA certified organic brand, Horizon Organic Milk, and plant for alternative brands like So Delicious, Self, Oh Yeah, and more. Uh, so we consider ourselves a very climate-driven company. We actually have 
commitments around soil health and regenerative agriculture that were started uh, before I even came to the company. And it's actually what drew me to the company in 2018 was our $6 million commitment around soil health. Uh, so I've had the pleasure of working with a cross-functional team to bring about innovation within our regenerative agriculture platform. And beyond that initial investment of $6 million, my role is to open big doors on grants. That's awesome. And, I, you know, I I love this. I love hearing about a big company who actually cares about the planet. So many times, I think the narrative when you're in the environmental space is that these big companies don't care. They're evil. They're out for profit. But, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you would disagree with that. Well, our parent company, the non-corporate, is headed up by an activist, CEO, uh, Emmanuel Faber, who has been consistent in sharing a climate vision for the company, which includes regenerative agriculture as a key component to reduce our carbon footprint. We also talk a lot about bringing that biodiversity within ecosystems, both above and below the ground, and putting farmer profitability and resilience at the center of our conversation. Um, there's also some examples I can give you of how we work directly with over 600 family farms. And companies of our size are usually purchasing commoditized milk that does not allow them visibility back to the farm level. But because we have these direct relationships with our farming partners, we're able to purchase 100% of the milk from their farms and talk directly with them about what they need to transition on the regenerative spectrum. So it's so cool because we have this, we have a narrative in the U.S. about, you know, rural America is being left behind and really struggling. And so seeing, uh, you know, capital returning to these these smaller communities, I think is so important. And then also having this next layer, which is the environmental benefit. And, and you brought up biodiversity, which I think is a perfect tangent to talk to Matias, who runs Bee Flow. I actually just did a video about bees. So I'm feeling very connected to the bees right now. So I'm glad you're here. Uh, can you explain how bee flow works and how your bee pollination system is able to actually increase uh you know the harvest of these farms isn't that right yeah that's right uh so we found a space in agriculture where there hasn't been any innovation over the last 50 years you know you can feed the plants with the best fertilizer in the world that maybe spent hundreds of millions of dollars of development which is making the plants grow faster but not necessarily good for the soil but 70 percent of the crops in the world need to be pollinating the flowers and turning a flower into an almond, into a strawberry, into a cherry, into an apple, an avocado. 70% of the crops in the world depend on it. So we found that pollination is a really complex biological process where there are some inefficiencies that happen. And we're solving those inefficiencies with scientific knowledge and technologies. On one side, we're making bees health uh, do better. As you all know, bees are having a hard time because of different aspects. And we are focusing on bees' immune system by feeding the bees with plant-based molecules. We are enhancing their immune system and making them work up to seven times more under cold temperatures, which is really important for almond pollination and for the almond milk that we all uh, have on our mornings. Also, we are training bees to pollinate specific target crops, which is something that sounds like science fiction, but it's true. Bees are really smart insects and they go to where the food sources are. Uh, but there's some crops like blueberries that don't have that much nectar. And we found a way to condition bees' memory to pollinate specific target crops. So we are training the bees to go to blueberry flowers to deliver more pollen and to increase crop yields. We've done tri trials over the last four years and we increased up to 90% crop yields by using nature as technology, by understanding better the role that biodiversity plays in our food systems. That is amazing. And are the bee hives, like, do you plop them down at the edge of the blueberry field every year? Or are you able to move them? Or how does that work? Yeah. Uh, so the way it's currently done is beekeepers move bees from all over the world. They move them from, from the country. They move them from Florida to California in large tracks, which, of course, is not sustainable at all. Like, if you think about agriculture, we turned land into monocultive crops. There are 1 million acres of almonds in California. That's 80% of the almond production in the world. But what about natural habitats? What about that biodiversity that was there? What about those insects and wild bees that were present there? We removed them all. So because of that, we decided to start bringing beehives. Uh, humans started doing it because they found that there were no more wild bees out there in the fields. So what we're doing at BeeFlow is bringing that back again. Right doing everything that is needed uh, to have a bees population thrive and not only work with beekeepers, but also work with other type of bees like bumblebees or blue orchard bees. 
there are 20,000 bee species in the world. People don't right. know. And they all play a very significant role in our food systems. And I love what you said about how you're using the technology of nature. Bees are so wise. I think that we have so many mysteries even to discover of their still because they just, I mean, they're magical. They're, they're, they're on a, the wavelength of nature that we, we can't even begin to comprehend. But that brings me to my next question, which I open up to all of you, is looking at this intersection between going back to the ancient wisdom of the planet. Like, you know, Kawe, you were talking about indigenous, you know, wisdom that you've used in your business. I, I know permaculture, you know, you're, you're in the same space with that. Michael, you're growing fish in a lab for now before they're commercially made. And um, do you think that this ancient wisdom and technology should be working in harmony or is there some inherent tension there between uh, the, the technology and, and, and the ancient wisdom? Who wants to go? Who, who, I, okay, I can, go. I can jump on it. I think there's a very interesting push from consumers starting to really be careful about the source of their foods. And uh, there has been a lot uh, to talk about it. Uh, people choosing organic produce, and although they don't really understand what organic means, organic farmers spray twice as many pesticides as a conventional farmer. Uh, which there's a lot of education to be done. Uh, consumers are starting to be more aware. So farmers need to adapt. Uh, I bet companies like Danone, uh, they're very interested in getting uh, almonds uh, to produce their almond milk called silk uh, with uh, sources of food that take care of the environment as well, uh, with farmers that take care about the bees and, and about biodiversity. So I think uh, there is a consumer trend and uh, that is going to push back uh, the food chain uh, and farmers will have to do regenerative agriculture, uh, yes or yes, uh, to take care more about our planet. Uh, I just I just want to add here because Matthias got into uh, organic farming, saying that you use more pesticide. <laughs> you do have to use types of pesticides, but th th these are pesticides that like are not harmful to the environment, like traditional pesticides would, or pesticides that will not kill bees and things like that. So I think there's definitely a way to work with technology and this ancient ways of farming. Uh, we big farms are learning how to be more mindful and, and use less water and irrigate only when needed. And that's just only uh, um, capable because of technology. So there is a lot of ways I think that we can be more efficient uh, when producing the food, when shipping the food with technology, as well as going back, as I said earlier, working with the smaller farmers and, and learn from the Asian uh, um, wisdom. So uh, I think everyone here cares about the environment and wants to do better. So uh, I am totally open to combining technology and, and just to try anything that we can to be better for the planet. Does anyone want to add to that, that idea? Yeah, Tina. Yeah. Oh, I think your audio, Tina, is going out again. I can jump in. Um, <laughs> Speaking of technology, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. yeah, in terms of like regenerative agriculture, obviously we don't have much to say in terms of that being a company that you know makes fish meat from stem cells. But you know, in terms of like uh, going off of like traditions in food production, we were invested in by a Japanese seafood company, and like we really want to bring these like older traditions of Japanese seafood, you know, specifically through the lens of sushi and sashimi to the U.S. Because we think there's just like a really rich cultural tradition there, a lot of which hasn't yet been brought to the U.S. for one reason or another. So. You know, even though we are high tech, you know, I think that there's definitely a lot of ways that you can collaborate with the old way of doing things. I think there's a lot that um, that we can learn from it. Uh, yeah. There's a, there's a, a something uh, by the United Nations called uh, Think Nature, which is really cool. It's is a way to use technology to learn from nature. So we are trying to come up with these innovative <laughs> ideas, and like a, we, we think we're so smart, but like we have been doing this for like a hundred years, let's say. Nature has been perfecting everything for billions of years. So uh, if we try to like uh, uh, learn from their science, and, and as Matthias said, from the bees, they are way more evolved and they already figured things out. So definitely uh, good to learn from nature with technology. 
I, I agree with you, Kelly. I think that we that we have so much to learn. Just from doing my my story, I did a video on honeybees and learning about how much we just haven't studied about just the the makeup of what they create and how there could be healing properties in it. And it's it's just so fascinating to think about all the secrets that nature holds. I think, but I do I, I agree with all of you in that I think it's not a conflict. I think that there's a happy marriage between technology and nature. And like oh, I think everyone at this on this panel is is aligned with that. So um, I'm sorry, Tina's still having technical difficulties. So this is the one situation where I think technology is not on our side. So I would love to be hearing more from her, but while she figures out her audio, I wanna ask Michael again about um, the cell-based technology they're using to produce this fish. Is this something that could go beyond bluefin tuna to other types of fish and other animals? Yeah, absolutely. So Finless is really a platform. We've worked with 12 species of fish so far, including all sorts of stuff, uh, edible and not, in order to build up this data library that allows us, uh, like the point of the company is to be allowed to go towards new species. And you know, one of the things that I think is most interesting that we can do is take varieties of fish that were once considered like local or exotic to places that we don't live in and make them available to the masses. So like, you know, uh, I really love this one type of fish called hamo that I talk about a lot. It's really only available in Japan. And that's because it's very difficult or maybe near impossible to farm it. And quantities of it in the wild are very limited. Well, you know, if we can get some samples of hamo, we can bring that to the US and actually expose people to new cuisines, new varieties of food. And um, that's why it's so cool to be partnered like with people um, in a country that really values seafood um, because we can really change the way seafood is eaten using this platform that we've built in order to do specifically that. Very cool. Seems like the sky is the limit when it comes to that technology. I want to go now to, who do I want to go to? I have a list over here. Matthias, we're talking about the bees, which obviously you can tell I, I love. Um, is there a benefit to climate change when you're working with the bees? And maybe it's because you're using less inputs and in fertilizers or anything like that. What is that connection? That's a great question. Thanks for asking. Um, yes, of course. Uh, especially because you think about, let's say we have an almond farm um, and we produce 30% more almonds by enhancing this natural process called pollination. So they're using the same amount of water, the same amount of pesticides, which means that they're using 30% less pesticides per pound produced. Does it make sense? So in that way, uh, the environmental impact that they're generating per pound of food produced is being reduced substantially. Even it's more impactful than a new genetic variety that maybe large corporations are investing millions of dollars to improve 5% crop yields. We're doing 40, 60% by understanding better uh, those billions of years of evolution and how bees uh, interact with, with plants. That, that is so cool to make that connection. And that makes sense. If, they're, if the plants are doing better, you then need other, less resources in other areas, which, which which is very cool to think about. And so, Kawe, I want to talk to you about your company, Barnana, and the fact that you were founded on you know a moral mission to end food waste. And what have you learned from having that mission? And do you think that other companies should be adopting similar uh, practices as you? Uh, yes. I think I want to clarify the company was not founded with that mission. And I think oh, that makes it sorry. even cooler because <laughs> I learned about the problem. So uh, if other companies don't really have a, a, a mission to help the planet, it's not too late. You can always find ways to become better. I set out to like a, a create a delicious snack. And now we are working with uh, uh, indigenous farmers reducing food waste. So, uh, we all are learning as we go and you always can be better. Uh, I, I advise other companies to do it because consumers are voting with their dollars. Once you have a mission, you, your capability of retaining consumers is a lot higher. Uh, they are more passionate about your brand. They will tell, tell their friends. Uh, they really stand behind uh, the company. Plus, uh, there is a lot of incentives. Not We all hope that one day there is more incentives from the government to, to help regenerative agriculture, to help farmers to be organic, to be more sustainable. But there's also a, a, a private companies willing to invest in companies that help, that care about the environment, they're willing to invest in your company and, and may help this uh, be bigger. Uh, hopefully uh, Tina can come and, and we can hear from her. But I was very inspired by Danone being the biggest B Corp out there 
Barnana is also a B Corp, and we really care about that triple bottom line. It's not just about the profits, it's about the planet, and it's about the, the people. So uh, consumers are supporting these type of companies. There is a, a private investor supporting those type of companies, and, and the known proof that you can be a very large and profitable company and you still give back. Yeah, yeah, and I think Barnana, anyone can buy your products right now. And you guys are around around the U.S., right? Where are you on sold right now? Yeah, we you can buy us from uh, Whole Foods to Costco, Amazon, uh, small convenience stores, or through our web website at barnana.com. That's amazing. Uh, Tino, do you want we want to try you one more time just for like an old college try? Is that <laughs> just to see if you can if your audio is coming through, or do we? Or, or is it definitely not working on your end? Because I would love to talk to you more, obviously. I, I'm sorry that we've had a little bit of a technical issue. Tina? Oh, she might not be able to hear us at all. Mm, she no. can't hear us. Okay, sorry Come guys. On. So Tina's having technical difficulties. She's so amazing and has so much wisdom. So I hope that you all can get a chance to um, hear from her another time. But for the three of you all who still do have audio, I'm gonna uh, continue the conversation with you guys. Um, and I'm gonna ask you about policy. I mean, we've got a big election coming up in the US. Um, what is the best way for individuals to get involved in, in, in your opinion? Maybe Michael, I'll ask you, um, what do you think about uh, getting people involved to make a difference and, and really impact the future of food? Yes, I mean, in terms of uh, the election, I mean, we unfortunately have two candidates, neither of whom have climate policies that are at all adequate for meeting the challenge. Um, so I would encourage people to get involved locally. I would encourage people to not just vote. Voting is really the absolute bare minimum of what anyone can do, but to organize, to really like get involved in your community, meet people and create something uh, bigger than yourselves because that's how we can actually move forward. For our industry in particular, I would say um, there's this really amazing nonprofit called New Harvest that is um, putting money towards grants for people to do work as PhD students uh, forwarding cellular agriculture, we should um, get more public funding for that. Like the fact that there's a nonprofit is awesome. I love the work that they do. Um, but countries like the Netherlands that are really forward thinking are putting money towards grants for people to actually do publicly funded research in cellular agriculture. And if we don't want to be left behind in this agricultural race, we need to do the same if we want to forward this industry. Um, innovation can definitely happen in the private sector, but it's often really spurred on by innovations in the public sector that end up getting commercialized. So I think if people really want to get involved, I mean, don't just vote, get organized, like make sure that you have like a group that you can do things with and, and build power locally, learn how to build, hold and wield power, not just do this sort of weak voting thing every like two to four years. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, that is such good advice. I agree with you so much in everything that you said. I, I wonder, uh, Matthias, do you have anything to add about getting involved or voting? Yeah, of course. Uh, um, I think supporting those young companies and entrepreneurs that are trying to do better for the planet in the way that um, they're producing their foods, uh, like buying banana uh, snacks, for example, or buying uh, Michael's uh, food when he has it out in the market. I think it's just really, really, really important uh, making the right choices as consumers and, and studying and learning about um, um, the sources of the foods uh, could play a, a significant role uh, learning more about it and making the right decisions. Awesome. And, and Kawe, what about you? Uh, I, I second what Michael and Matthias uh, said as well. I think that uh, Voting is definitely very important, but not only voting, voting to the right candidates, learning about their policies, uh, understand who has a plan uh, to, to better the environment, uh, change the way we farm, uh, interesting, incentivize farmers to, to become better and more uh, sustainable. Um, and we all can vote with our dollars, as, as Matias said. You can support uh, companies like Barnana, Danone. There is a lot of companies uh, doing good out there. So that is a good way that we can uh, start and, and make a change today. So uh, be out there, uh, promote other, other products, tell, tell people uh, to vote at Barnana. Uh, we are giving everyone a day off if they didn't have the opportunity to vote before. So. Um, I think that it's very important to, to really voice uh, 
the way you feel vote by voting and by buying and supporting products. That's awesome. Well, there's a really great, speaking of policy, we've got the Growing Climate Solutions Act, which is looking at the agricultural sector, which is obviously a huge source of carbon emissions right now. And it's uh, addressing that sector is a huge part of addressing climate change. And so this Growing Climate Solutions Act would basically move toward climate friendly, sustainable farming practices and help you know incentivize farmers to uh, make those changes. If you guys are familiar with this bill, which has support from 50 businesses, farm groups, McDonald's and Microsoft, can any of you all chime in on what you think about the Growing Climate Solutions Act? I mean, I can I can do that. Um, yeah, I can talk about it for a sec. I mean, so yeah, it like creates a certification program where the USDA helps create um, like conditions to support a carbon credit ecosystem and, and market um, with farmer and for forest like people who own like land as farmers or as or as forest forest landowners as well as private actor like private sector actors. Um, basically, it provides landowners like access to funding that can support their transition to more sustainable practices by monetizing climate value. Um, I think it's a step in the right direction. Like it, it sees ag and land practices as key tools for carbon capture, which they are, um, and it works to improve sustainability in areas that are like achievable. Um, yeah, so it's just uh, like it's one of many areas that still are needed to tackle the climate crisis. Um, hopefully, this can like help us all support a paradigm shift as like seeing food as yeah. an integral uh, part of piece of the puzzle. I totally agree. Are there any things in particular with your all, your all's companies or industries that would help, like, is there a particular policy, you guys are all kind of coming at it from different angles that would help you, like if you kind of look and say, oh, it would really help if we had, you know, a price on food waste or anything like that. Do you think about these things that would maybe really help support your work even further? Uh, I can add to this. Uh, if you look at food waste and all the food that we grow, one third uh, of all the food that we produce will end up going to waste. So in, in the U.S. alone, uh, if we reduce that food, it would be the equivalent to removing 37 million cars from the roads. So it's, it's very, very impactful because you're talking about all the water and the energy that grows that, that goes into growing the food, and then transporting that food and the package, uh, and all of that goes to waste with the food that you throw away. So, if there was incentives for uh, uh, grocery stores, uh, transportation companies to become more efficient, to learn with technology or or uh, ways that the government could help uh, food waste to reduce, that would be a big impact and everyone will be winning from that. Nice, I, 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 that makes so much sense. And I think we are now able to go to our Q&A, which is awesome. We have a first question from James, who is asking all of us, what is your opinion on consumer buyer adoption versus regulation versus science versus a business model? And what is the biggest hurdle for you each? That is a lot there. I don't think if you wanna pick part of it <laughs> uh, and answer that, um, I don't know, Michael, do you have anything to say on that? I, you know, for some reason, have something to say about everything, I guess. <laughs> uh, it, um, yeah, I mean, like for us, like consumer buyer adoption, what we want to do is like really meet people where they're at, right? Like we want to make something that people are already activated and interested in buying and go with it that way. Um, there's some studies out on like cell-based meat and consumer adoption, even though we haven't hit market yet. And it seems that even with the absolute most like pessimistic um, estimates, um, where we call what we make something really gross, like lab grown mm. or like or artificial, it still ends up with like thirty percent adoption. And that's not just people who are trying it, but people who are who genuinely feel they'll work it into their diet, even with these gross names. And you're using better names for it, like cell based meat or cultivated meat or even clean meat. Um, these get much, much higher levels of perceived consumer adoption. Um, those studies put it up way above 70% of people working it into their diets. And my reaction to that is like, well, if we can get 70% of the population eating cell-based meat, uh, we're, we're in a good place. Like, I, I'd be pretty pleased with that. Um, one interesting bit is that it seems that younger generations are, are much more likely to work um, food technology into their diet, whereas older generations are a little bit more cautious feeling about it. Um, which makes some sense, but it means that like people's attitudes towards food technology are changing. People are becoming friendlier towards it, which I think is a really positive thing for the environment. 
That's so interesting that you said that 30% adoption rate. Do you have a rate that would for you be ideal for like consumers to now, you know, 30% of their meat is lab grown or cell based? Is that where you're aiming for? Can I say a hundred? Is that okay? Am I allowed to yeah, do that? Yeah, sure. You can do a hundred. A hundred. No, I mean like <laughs> it depends on the meat. It depends on what type of problem we're trying to solve, right? Like for us, bluefin tuna is, you know, uh, is a threatened species. And so like, it's really important. And, and there's been tons of NGO work to try and decrease bluefin tuna consumption specifically. There's meat that does a lot in terms of CO2 emissions like beef. And then there's meat that does a lot less like chicken, which really the issues there are more associated with like toxic runoff and land use and water use. Um, so it's just like, it's, it's, I know this is like an incredibly unsatisfying answer, but it's just, it's complicated. And yeah. uh, as much as I we mean, can do it's great. I agree with that. I cover sustainability issues for my job and get to cover all different aspects of it. And the more that I learn, the more I just say it's complicated and it depends. <laughs> so I, I think I agree with you. So our next question for our Q&A is what are your thoughts on plant based meat, both for the environment as well as personal health? From Brian and Tina, as we know, if you've been tuned in, she's having audio issues, but she is our regenerative ag and regeneratively, regeneratively, regeneratively raised meat expert that we are missing her voice here. But she did say in our chat that the closer we can get to regeneratively raised meat, the better off we will be for the climate. And I recently just did a video on regeneratively uh, grown food and um, its ability to sequester carbon, I think is a huge, has huge potential, like all of these different aspects of trying to bring carbon emissions down in our agricultural system. Does anyone else want to chime in on their perspective on the plant-based meat, which uh, is different than cell-based meat, which, which I now know? <laughs> yes, uh, I think it's very difficult to give, uh, it's not, there's no a, a yes or no here because there's a lot of different types of plant-based meat. I think that uh, some are becoming very processed and, and use a lot of things that we don't even know what they are. Uh, a lot of GMOs and those, I don't think they're good, but there's some that like a, a utilize uh, a lot less um, ingredients and are very healthy as well. But you also uh, can support farmers that are have regenerative agriculture and, and have real meat that is not bad for the environment. If we think uh, 200 years ago, there was way more wild animals running and bison, and they were not bad for the environment. So it's just a matter of like a, uh, trying to improve, uh, no matter what you do. If you eat real meat, try to, to eat the real meat that is better for the environment. And if you eat plant-based meat, uh, try to, to learn more and, and one that is less processed and is better for you. Right, that, make, that makes so much sense. We have another question, which kind of touches upon the same issue, which is what type of food consumers are all of you and why from Ashley? This is a great question. I'm gonna answer too. I think they said if it's an all, I'm allowed to answer. <laughs> I do a uh, farm share with a local company here in New York City called Local Roots. So I get a box delivered every week that has some frozen regeneratively raised meat, um, organic fruits and vegetables. And that's just been really fun for me to feel like a good portion of my diet is coming from farmers that are growing things the right way, and it's within 200 miles of New York. So that's where I try to really make my impact. Um, but I would love to ask all of you what you think. And Tina, who we all know is having technical difficulties, wrote in our comments, I have I am a heavy organic food consumer and believe strongly in how positively it impacts the environment and our own bodies. I agree with you, Tina. That's that's a great answer. And do you guys have, what are your food consumer? I would love each of us to go around. My, my, Michael, we'll start with you. How do you answer that question? I'm always the most annoying. I uh, <laughs> pretty against organic food in general. Um, I went to school for biochemistry at an agricultural school. Um, I think that something that's illuminating that people could watch to learn more is a documentary called Food Evolution. Um, there's a lot of concerns that I have with organic agriculture. It uses, in general, considerably more water, considerably more pesticides than its conventional equivalent. And I worry that it's just a marketing scheme. And I think there are some people who do it really well, right? Like local farmers do it really well, like good um, regenerative agriculture practices, but these people don't generally end up with an organic label because the organic label is extremely difficult mm. to get in the United States. And so I'm not saying local food is bad or that pesticides are, are good, but I think that people should have a bit of a more nuanced take on it. I myself try and avoid organic food wherever possible. Um, I shop at my local farmer's market though. So I know those two things can seem contradictory, but it's just agriculture is complicated. There's a lot of competing interests in there and there's a lot of people who are trying to sell you stuff. 
And so I think uh, Food Evolution is a great starting point for a documentary you can watch to learn a bit about um, the topic. Do you think that something like organic, uh, like you should, the label um, should change? Is that what you're saying around that? Because it just, like, what is that what you mean by that, Michael, too? That like people are using that organic when they're not necessarily doing anything. Um, wait, also Tina um, is chiming in here and says, organic also means no artificial colors or flavors in different ways that the food is processed. So yeah, I think I, processing also, like what Kawe was saying, I mean, processing is something that I would argue is a little bit more like correlation than causation. Like peeling an apple is technically processing, you know? And so like the idea of like processed foods are bad for you, I think it's because a lot of the time processed foods are a lot less fresh a lot of the time. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that these plant-based meats are worse for you than eating like a burger. I mean, if you're eating a burger, a burger is not good for you just in general. And like the idea of eating a plant-based one being any worse for you, I really don't think so. But I think consumers aren't reaching for a burger when they're looking for healthy options. So I think calling these like plant-based equivalents, you know, calling them processed, it to me is like an animal egg talking point. Um, I don't know. I, I disagree with it. And, and I just want to add here, my family has a farm that has been our family for 200 years. So I'm talking from the side that I understand food, I understand where food comes from. Uh, we work with over 2,000 small farmers, like I said, in the Amazon. Uh, you agree, I agree with you, Michael. It's difficult and, and expensive to get your organic certification. We help those farmers to get that. Uh, I, and I disagree with you saying, oh, I avoid organic food, because uh, when you say that, it doesn't sound like you know what you're talking about, because it's very generic. Uh, I know firsthand that when you have organic farming, you are promoting biodiversity. To get the organic certification, you have to have at least 20% of your farm with other type of plants. Uh, you, you have different weeds around that bring nitrogen to the soil. You promote uh, a lot or small animals and insects. And if you just say like, oh, organic is bad, you are saying that you don't mind all the chemicals and the glyphosate and everything that goes into conventional farming. It's the same way as me saying, oh, I disagree with lab uh, uh, grown food, that's gross. That doesn't make any sense. I'm not gonna say that because there is the pros and cons on everything. So I, I, I would just, it's a fine line to say, oh, all organic food is bad and all lab grown food is bad. Totally. I think there's nuance in there. I don't think that blanket statements are useful. I, I will say, though, that I mean, you know, the concept of like, uh, like growing plants together in order to create more biodiversity, that's not limited to organic. I mean, like your farmers down in Brazil, like it sounds like that's what they're doing and they're not organic certified. So like basically there is even more nuance to this, right? Like these practices aren't limited to organic farming. Things like reducing pesticides aren't limited to organic farming. I mean, you're talking about chemicals. It's in the US, at least. I'm just talking specifically about um, USDA certified organic food, not organic as a concept more broadly. Um, it uses more pesticides than conventional agriculture. And that's because some pesticides are like not allowed because they are synthetic, which is an arbitrary distinction. And so it's just, uh, I do think that like organic has potential to be something that's better, right? Like we should be able to have a labeling system that allows consumers to see what types of foods hold their values when they're trying to buy food. But I think that the label could use some work. I think that there's some parts of it that are really prohibitive to smaller farmers like yourselves that are having trouble getting organic. Like that, that sucks. Like it sounds like what you're doing is good for the environment. I wish that they could get that label more easily so that it would allow like people in America, like people who are buying this stuff to know that it's good. And I wish that it wasn't like prohibitive of other like um, helpful farming practices to reduce pesticide use. And, and that's what we're saying. We're helping everyone. So all our products uh, until the regenerative are certified organic and we're helping them to get that, uh, that certification. And what the certification does is, is put some, put some regulations because yeah, you, you can promote biodiversity in a conventional farming, but you don't have any, any baseline. You don't have to follow anything. So someone may or may not do. So what organic does is you have to do it. Otherwise you don't get that certification. And of course, they're like, one may say, oh, there's fraud and things like that. There's problems in all industries. I think like a, uh, at least with organic, we know that there's a lot of good people that are trying to do good and we have a baseline to start from. I think to summarize, like I, I love this interaction. Um, <laughs> I think there's, there's a need uh, for consumers to educate themselves more and, and to make the right choices. And overall, the consumers will pick the, the, the food that they want to buy. 
um, there's a need to educate more about where our foods are coming from, uh, for people to walk more farms, get out of the cities and go and go to the farm and pick some blueberries, which is beautiful. And you can still do it, uh, which is something uh, really nice to do. And also uh, be really conscious, I think, um, well, one of the aspects we are tackling with, with B-Flow is, is food waste in the very st early stage on the food systems. Uh, Kawe talked about it, malformation of fruits. You know, we are very um, strict on only eating perfectly shaped strawberries. Why? If up to 40% of the strawberries in the world are being discarded because they're not perfectly shaped. And the reason they're malformed uh, is because of lack of pollination, is because the pollen that the bees deliver to the flower was not enough to make all the ovules uh, fecundated by a pollen grain turn into a seed and then to develop as many seeds the fruit can grow to produce a perfectly shaped fruit. So pollination plays a significant role in terms of food waste, but we need to be less strict about only eating perfectly uh, apples because they're as nutritious as a malformed apple. That this has been a, I love this conversation right now, and I and I want to keep going and debating all this stuff. But I'm going to go to our last Q and A. We only have five minutes left, and it's about food deserts in the U.S. One of the biggest food policy issues is the issue of food deserts, and I want, I'm wondering how are you all trying to alleviate this problem, provide easier access to affordable, fresh, sustainable products? And Tina weighed in because she's having audio issues, and she said that Danone North America is very involved ensuring that many of our brands can be accessed through food assistance programs, supporting many local food banks during COVID, and also ensuring mothers can act as our happy family brand through women and infant children, also known as WIC. Um, they also offer a wide variety of products within every price point in order to ensure access to healthy foods like yogurt. How all are you, I think I, I wanna open this question up to you all because again, this it, it connects back to this idea of organic. It's a higher price point. It's not as accessible. It, it might, you know, there's not as much of it and like people should still be able to eat well and eat good even without having to pay a lot of money. And I think that's everyone's goal at this on this panel. So how are you guys uh, trying to you know, alleviate this problem of food deserts and making this food more accessible? I think that's something that, that would be great for the government to incentivize and to help bring those grocery stores and fresh produce to, to certain areas. Uh, for there, there's someone here in LA that is uh, amazing. His name is Ron Feely. Uh He did a lot of talks on about these food deserts where uh, fresh food is not available in a lot of areas, and he promotes people to grow gardens outside their homes. Uh, and he got in trouble uh, for that here, which was crazy because he was in trouble for growing fresh food in a, a empty lot that only had dirt before. So there is a lot of uh, uh, people trying to do good things. We, like the known, try to, uh, to, to promote and bring fr products that are healthier to uh, communities that wouldn't otherwise have access to that. But there's a lot of people trying to do that, but it would be great to see the government doing more and helping subsidize that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we know with what the government chooses to subsidize and what is affordable uh, and what's not, it's so much government policy, so that's such a good point. Does anyone want to add to that? I would say for Pinless, I mean, um, right now, over 90% of American seafood is imported. Um, so that means that um, none of it's fresh, basically. Like we even do produce some seafood here. Uh, about 30% of that number is produced in the United States, but we ship it to China for processing before it gets shipped back to the US. So what we want to do is create a domestic seafood supply. So something that's actually much fresher. If seafood were fresher, it would be able to penetrate more hard to reach areas like these food deserts, because right now it's very much stymied by having to be near ports or at least near bodies of water in order to actually get to people before it spoils and causes foodborne illnesses. So what we can do is really produce seafood anywhere in the United States, no matter what its relationship to the water is. And I think that that's a really huge step in creating a more like agile food supply that not only can adapt to the you know to the climate change that we're going to suffer through in the next few years, as well as alleviate things like food deserts. Nice. Well, I, I, I think this has been such a 
great conversation. Uh, and you all bring such fresh perspectives. You're so informed in your field. So I, I appreciate this chance to chat with you all and hopefully we can all stay in touch. And I'm gonna visit each one of you and do a story on all of you. So let's do that. Um, but thank you so much. Um, and thank you to everybody who watched the Future Party for hosting this event. And again, we're sorry we had a little bit of technical difficulties, but this is the Zoom era that we live in. Um, it was amazing that we were all able to be together and talk about these issues. And I think we all care about the future of food and our future of our planet. So hopefully we got some great ideas out there today and I'll talk to you all later. Thank you guys. What's up guys, Boye from The Future Party here. Thank you so much for watching the video. Hope you enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. We've got some amazing content coming your way. Don't miss out. Like, subscribe, hit the bell for more notifications. Check out more on The Future Party in the description. All the things. Peace out for now. See you later.